Today we are focusing on a critical issue that impacts the health of women across South Africa. Cervical cancer, alarmingly, it is the second most common cancer among women in our country with a staggering 50.5% increase in deaths due to cervical cancer between 2008 and 2018 according to Stats SA. These statistics underscore the urgent need for greater awareness and proactive measures to combat this this disease. Mm, indeed. Uh, I mean, this uh, just thinking about cancer in itself, it's uh, devastating. But to help us understand the gravity of the situation and the importance of regular screening, we are joined by specialist surgeon Dr. Fatima Hossein. And uh, she's going to be helping us uh, as she is at the forefront of advocating for women's health and raising awareness about cervical cancer. And today she will share her expertise on the subject and discuss what can be done to reverse this concerning trend. Dr. Hussain, assalamu and welcome. I feel like we need a drum roll, Ahmed. Is there no <laughs> drum roll in the back? No. For myself, just because I'm so excited to have well, you. Salam, Farida. I'm so blessed and happy to be here this evening. And to Khalid, Assalamu alaikum. And thank you for having me in the studio today. Shukran for being with us. Uh, Dr. Hussain, I mean, we've, we've been having conversations around cancer. And we know that... Um, Always those conversations are hard to have and uh, very difficult for myself to understand. Um, and even perhaps for listeners who feel that what is cancer if they have no relation to it and just hearing it for the first time. So these statistics on uh, cervical cancer in South Africa are quite alarming. I would think that I know that with the work around cancer that there are um, measures and, and steps being taken to sort of prevent it. Uh, so could you help us understand what what might be contributing to the significant rise in deaths uh, due to cervical cancer? I think in South Africa, the the biggest um, contributor to uh, the re- well people contracting cervix uh, cervical cancer and for them passing away uh, re- as a result thereof is its is its close relation of uh, human papilloma virus or the HPV virus with the HIV virus. Um, so HIV generally. Um, causes the immunosuppression and the HPV then um, can cause the cervix cancer and the body doesn't have a a really good um, way to, how would I say, um, to fight or to fend for itself, um, which results in a rapid progression and often the patient demising from the disease. Um, and the reason why we link the two is because both HIV and HPV are both sexually transmitted. Mm-hmm. And I know a lot of people, especially um, uh, Muslim people, we, we tend not to like to talk about sex and we we don't really like to um, acknowledge that our youth or uh, uh, the, our community uh, is engaging um, in, in the act of sexual uh, intercourse. It's something uh, still that is a taboo topic uh, predominantly. And I think it's something that is very important that we acknowledge is happening, not always within the constraints that um, were advocated by our Prophet Sallallahu right. Alaihi Wasallam. Um, and, and therefore, we do actually in our communities, um, uh, our own communities and obviously communities at large um, have yeah. HIV and HPV exposure and we must just acknowledge that so that we can um, take the measures that are required to to intervene on them. So that would mean that uh, our community needs to wake up to yeah. the realities of um, people having uh, unprotected sex and sex out of marriage and then also the consequences of that but irrespective of the consequences the reality is that HIV and HPV does come through um, being intimate with someone so then are we saying that we before we even get to cervical cancer we need to have the sex talk as they would say? Absolutely, and I think we. Um, I've had it in my, in my own family where we we've had uh, debates about um, how to discuss it with our kids um, or whether it should even be discussed with our kids. Um, and I think it's something that um, makes me makes me. I, I'm I'm one of those people that's very open. Um, even if it's not necessarily happening, we must try and prepare our children for 
the risks that they may take. So if, if God forbid, they do make mistakes, um, which are inherent for young people, um, different children make different mistakes. We can only hope that ours don't make um, the mistakes that you try and teach them not to make. Mm -hmm. But if you give them the skills and the knowledge of what can happen um, and you have these talks with them, I think it's it, it allows you, it, allow, it gives you that openness and allows them to make the decisions to help themselves if required and when required. Mm, so I think it, but it does start with openness, absolutely, and, and to acknowledge that these things are actually happening. So regular screening is often highlighted, you know, as a key preventive measure. Could you sort of explain the different types of screening available, such as uh, the pap smears and HPV tests, and how often women should be getting them? Um, so there's a, a HPV test. Test so um, that's an uh, kind of like an assay which tests for the HPV virus itself. Um, so that essentially, or the high risk variants of the HPV, there's lots of different ones. Um, the HPV 16 and 18 um, are the ones that are specifically related to cervix uh, cancer, um, and that's what the HPV uh, test tests for. And you. Um, I think international guidelines suggest that you can do the HPV test um, uh, um, um, after the age of 30. You can do it every five years, um, especially if you, well, you should do it if you are sexually active. Um, or you can do a pap smear. And a pap smear is actually like a, a, a test where they um, look at the cells that are in the cervi uh, uh, around the cervix and see if those are abnormal. So it actually looks at abnormal cells um, or looks for abnormal cells um, uh, that is, occurs as a result of the changes that happen um, because of HPV infection. And um, that should be done every three years. So interesting that highly that you mentioned that about the um, uh, HPV and the uh, the test and the, the pap smear, those are secondary kind of prevention. Um, so that is once the person is already sexually active, um, that you can get tested um, uh, at those specific intervals, five years or three years, to look for the effects of the HPV virus. But there is primary prevention, which is one of the things that I absolutely love about um, where we are in the space uh, um, regarding cervix cancer, because unlike many other cancers, we can actually prevent it from, ap from happening at all. We can prevent it. Um, and that comes in the form of the HPV um, vaccine, which is now being offered um, at schools uh, as part of the, um, the South African vaccination program um, from the age of 12. I'm glad you emphasize, you know, on the importance of those screening. You know, despite the importance of screening, many women do not go for regular checkups. What are some of the common barriers preventing women from accessing these services and how can we overcome them? So the first thing is that we don't talk about it. Um, and uh, it's never going to happen to us, of course. Um, I have one partner. I've only had this guy with for my whole life. And I trust him absolutely and completely. And it will never, therefore, it will never happen to me. Um, so that doesn't really work that way. Um, you trust yourself. Um, you don't always know what your partner is doing. You, in Alhamdulillah, many of us are in very monogamous relationships and some of us um, are not, unfortunately. We don't know that we are not, um, but we may be in such a relationship. And therefore, as soon as you have become sexually active, your health becomes your own responsibility mm -hmm. um, and you should go for cervical cancer screening. Again, this comes with the acknowledgement that this can happen to you. Um, and it's not about it. It's not about trust or not trusting in your partner or whatever. It's about just m doing the right thing and making sure that you get well taken care of. Um, and um, so that's one of the big barriers. And the other barriers is that um, a, a lot of people go for it once. They don't like the experience. It's very uncomfortable. It requires a lot of exposure. Uh, people have to show the nether regions to the doctor and 
people don't really like that. Um, so they don't really want to go for these tests. I'm sorry, Khalid, looking a little bit uncomfortable there. <laughs> um, but it's 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 something that, that does, um, it's not just you, it's a lot of women out there. They, they don't want to because they don't, like that experience um, but of course it's a necessary evil and it's only something that has to happen every three years if you do it and remember it it can pick up the disease in the very early stages um, when it's in the pre-cancerous phase um, thus preventing you from requiring radiation and chemo those words don't ever have to get used I think it's, it's it's really important, and I I mean we talk about screening, and I and I smiled when you said you know uh, girls uh, from the ages of twelve because I remember last year or the year before it was really a a tricky situation because in particular uh, Muslim parents are feeling like no why should my daughter have this vaccine um, and my thinking is prevention is better than a cure um, and those invasive um, procedures and and it, it's yes it's it, uncomfortable it's not the best thing i think uh if there was a way that one could look at one's toe for example <laughs> i'm sure the doctors would find a way to do so but it is in your private um space and area mm-hmm. and so it has to happen but i i know that you you've emphasize on you know the need for increased awareness um because i think if you can if it can be prevented um and you have the opportunity to live then choose life but what are some of the critical facts uh, about cervical cancer that women just don't get or don't seem to understand i know you mentioned trust is the one thing where women feel like oh i trust my partner and it won't happen to me um what are the other things that we just don't understand about cervical cancer? Um, I think there's a, 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 one of the things is that it um, people don't just develop it. It's not something that just happens. Um, uh, wow, I don't have cancer today, and tomorrow I have it. Um, it's something that develops. It's a it's a it's a it's a a multitude of changes that happened within the 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 cells of the of the cervix. And I'm, I'm saying HPV because it's the most common cause. It's not the only cause, I must just point out. Um, but <clears throat> um, though the, the infection, the depressed immune system, the um, various drugs, um, uh, uh, exposure to, to, to different things, obesity, smoking, all of those things, those stimulate those changes within um, uh, the cells. And as the the cells become more and more abnormal, then slowly they become abnormal. I would say there's like a critical point where um, the abnormality becomes aggressive and very invasive, and that is a cancer. So if you get it at the beginning phase where the cells are abnormal but they're not invasive, one can actually remove it completely uh, or, or address the issue completely without having to require um, oh, well, how would I call them? Um, the invasive treatments or the treatments that actually make us afraid of the word, the big C word, the cancer word, those big operations where you get a hysterectomy and those big operations, um, those big words like chemotherapy and you think of see your hair falling out and radiation therapy, all of those things that we don't like to hear about. If we understand that we can address this issue and that's why we want pe- people to do screening, mm. then I think um, it changes the entire landscape of how um, how the disease gets managed, how patients present. We can actually change the face of how people look at cancer or cervix cancer in particular. But um, And it starts off with understanding why we want you to do screening. It's actually to prevent the ugly C word. Um, I think that's one of the um, the things that we don't really understand about cancer, that it's that change. Um, And everybody thinks cancer is related to genetics. Okay, my mother didn't get it, so I'm not going to get it. But I've been saying over and over again that um, uh, cervix cancer is is very much associated with HPV and HIV. I mean, the vast majority, over 80% of it is related to that. Smoking, obesity, um, 
certain drugs, they can com- uh, contribute to it. But only 2 to 3%, less than 5% of all cervix cancers is actually genetic related, mm. which is an extremely small percentage. So if your mother didn't get it, it doesn't mean you're not going to get it. Mm. I wonder how do you then, um, because I, I, I'm, so yes, the one part is the sex talk with with young girls, and then the other part is trying to explain HPV and HIV to a twelve year old and saying, "Listen, this is a vaccine that is supposed to protect you. Uh, these are the things that can happen. Should you um, make a mistake, as you say, then this. I don't. I'm. What I'm trying to. I'm not encouraging unprotected sex. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm just wondering how do you have a conversation with a 12 year old in in order for them to understand and also then honor their bodies and not make mistakes? I think the first assumption is that we think that they don't know anything. Mm -hmm. Big mistake. They know a lot. They've been talking to all their friends who have been talking to their friends who've been talking to their bigger sisters and their aunts and listening in. So they know quite a bit about um, sex and um, uh, the various diseases and things like that. Oh, they, maybe not the, all the diseases, but they, do people talk about their bad experiences? Nobody's going to tell you they have chlamydia or HPV. Mm-hmm. They're going to tell you about the fun they had, yeah. if, if that or that sort of thing. They, they're not going to tell you the bad stuff. So that's where you come in. You can always start, I suppose you can start with a conversation of what do you know already? And let's be open about this. I mean, I can fill in the blanks for you. Yeah. And let's talk about the risks. Let's talk about uh, the benefits. Let's talk about what Islam says about this and why Islam says this about it. Mm. Um, Because I think uh, uh, the way um, our religion has has put it for us actually prevents so many of these things Mm. it actually does make things a a lot better and a lot easier and it can help your child make the right decisions Mm. um explaining to them the why um uh, uh, this whole thing's happened and and i think it's always important that you explain to them how to troubleshoot so if this happens because remember not all sex is consensual Yes, yes, indeed. Um, I, yeah, And it's not just the girls. Mm. Um, we tend to think that this is a, a girl problem. When you talk cervix cancer, you think this is a girl problem. Mm. But HPV is carried by males mm. as well. So where do the girls get it from? They're not getting it from each other. They're getting it from the guy. Yeah. Um, so we tend to think that we, the guy doesn't need to get vaccinated, but actually he does. We don't have to have this conversation with the boy, mm. but we do because he's the one that's going to give it to his wife mm. because he's participating in the sexual activity during his youth and may not realize a consequence later in life when he decides to, to um, I suppose, to get married, settle down. Mm. Yeah. So there are long-term effects of the decisions we make when we are young. So, yeah. There's a listener asking uh, for what is the clinical what is the clinical indications of cervical cancer. But I also just before you answer that question, Doctor, I was having a conversation with my producer and I was saying, I'm I'm frustrated with HPV. I'm frustrated that it's coming from our the other party, you know, because I'm saying I'm protecting myself and I'm I'm doing all the right things, and then you, another human being, and you infect me, and I and I feel like it's unfair, and I was complaining about it. Um, but I think it's very important that you mention when we are having the, this conversation with twelve-year-old uh, girls, you are having the same conversation with twelve-year-old boys, because. I think the vaccine conversation is so, um, to put it bluntly, shove down the girl's side. And so she must do all the protecting, but yet the one who carries it, carries it freely. So that I, I'm just saying that it's unfair, but please, um, if you could share your thoughts on that and also just uh, your the clinical indications for cervical cancer. So sorry to disappoint you, but uh, the vast majority of uh, is actually asymptomatic until it becomes a problem, um, which is why we want you to get screening. Uh, again, uh, screening is very important. Um, so it, it, 
it really doesn't present as much. Um, it can present um, for for a while until it is quite a significant mass. Um, it's generally painless, so um, doesn't really present with pain. It can present with a discharge, usually a foul smelling discharge. And when I mean foul smelling, it really does not smell. It's very malodorous, uh, if I may put it that way. Um, a mal. Um, it's not a. It's not a. It's not a good smell. Um, uh, any doctor who's <laughs> dealt with cervix cancer knows there's a specific scent that it comes with. Um, it presents with, uh, can have lymph nodes, little lymph nodes in the groin. These are little like bumps or round lumps that you feel in your, um, uh, between in the, you know, in your, where your hip joint is. Yes. You can feel it even there I in the groin it. area. <laughs> yes. Um, over there. Um, it can present with a little bit of blood. Um, so a bloody discharge as well. Um, and of course, uh, a mass. Uh, you can, that's usually quite a late sign um, when um, you start developing a mass that you are able to palpate. Um, it can also present with painful sex, sex. So if the sex is really painful, you really need to go and see your gynae um, to try and figure out why. We call that something called dyspareunia. Um, yeah, or especially um, in the uh, beginning um, phases, you may actually have uh, bleeding after participating in sexual intercourse. So um, uh, it can be as a result of stimulation of that very tender area um, where the cancer is growing. So again, if you're bleeding frequently after sexual intercourse, go and have a checkup with your gynae. Mm. Mm. Yes, HPV, very difficult. Before at the break, Dr. Fatima was emphasizing it's one thing to have the conversations with your young girls, but then also have the conversation with the young boys because they are the carriers and... She burst my bubble by saying they're asymptomatic, so it might just not, you, you won't know. Uh, but the, the talk is important, and the vaccine in itself is the prevention that is better than a cure. Now, just to answer a few, the listeners are saying, um, well, asking, is it safe for a non mukala is it safe for non mukallaf girls to take this vaccine even uh, even when they are not sexually active? This, uh, this was introduced to us on school and I remember my parents were against me taking the, this vaccine. Just wondering if this was the right choice. Also, does this vaccine act as a preventative measure when a girl does, uh, when a girl does marry and become sexually active? That's the whole point of the vaccine. Mm. I, I think that's a beautiful question that you asked. And I think um, question number one, um, is it safe for for um, a lady to or a young girl to have the uh, vaccine prior to um, them getting their menstrual cycle? And the answer is absolutely it is. Um, every, obviously, um, you've t- uh, we've all taken the mums, the measles, the rubella virus, or okay, not all of us, but the vast majority majority of us have had the MMR vaccines, the 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 vaccine against the uh, TB, um, all of those things when we were little. Um, this is the same. Um, it's exact. It's in the same class. It's been um, proven to be safe. Um, it's been tested on hundreds and thousands of people prior to it being put onto the market and being put into the vaccination um, uh, um, the vaccination drive um, one must just remember it's not like uh, I know people had a lot of issues with the COVID vaccine it wasn't developed under the same circumstances as the COVID vaccine um, it was developed over a long period of time with lots of research and um Lots of uh, testing. There wasn't as much urgency um, uh, with uh, the, the, the this HPV vaccine as there was with with the COVID vaccine. So it's as safe as all your other vaccinations that are in the um, uh, the South African vaccination program, and it's perfectly safe for women to get under the if they don't have their menstrual cycle. And yes, absolutely, it does prevent in the vast majority of cases. I mean, yes, there has been uh, a case or two where um, they have gotten HPV um, uh, despite having had the vaccine, um, but it it is 
preventative. So that's primary prevention, actually, to develop HPV. Um, that's that's why we want people to have the vaccine because it actually can prevent you from getting the dangerous variants of HPV, which can then eventually prevent you from getting um, cervix cancer altogether. Mm -hmm. So this is actually really good for for um, for one to get. I was actually just chatting to Farida before the uh, during the break, and I said uh, I have a I have a young uh, I have a young son. When he gets to that age where he can get the vaccine, um, I'm definitely pro vaccination. Um, uh, so I will most certainly have him vac get vaccinated. It's good. It's protective for him and it's protected for his wife. Inshallah. I mean, I mean, you know. Um, uh, we, we spoke now uh, about women, you know, who, who gets diagnosed with this cervical cancer. You know. What are the current treatment options available? And what challenges do patients often face, you know, during treatment? And how can they be supported? Wonderful question. Very loaded. So cervix cancer is very treatable. Obviously, like all, all um, cancers, uh, there are various stages. And obviously, stage four is the... Uh, stage where it's already metastasized and um, has a bit of a poorer prognosis. Um, it has all uh, the same, well, let's say you can treat it with surgery. That's usually the first line. If it's early, um, we like to treat the, the um, cervix cancer with surgically to remove it or excise that area. Mm. Um, it usually comes in the form of a, um, of a hysterectomy, um, which would include the um, cervix. So the, the cervix. Um, we would also often give the patient chemotherapy. Um, if it's a little bit of a later stage and we need to shrink it, chemotherapy usually forms uh, um, the initial phase of treatment. And then in certain cases, we also give the patient um, radiation therapy. Um, so that means um, radiation from the outside to the cervix uh, or the cervical area to shrink the area, uh, to shrink the, the, the cancer or yeah to help treat it, prevent it from... You spoke about the stages or the levels, you know, of this uh, treatment or something like that, uh, the, the options that are there. You mentioned, you know, uh, level one to level four. Now, uh, for your listeners sitting at home, you know, when you speak about levels, you know, you think about load shedding or something <laughs> like that. Level one, is it the highest or mm. level four is the highest stage one mm. uh so not levels stages <laughs> <laughs> uh, stage one is the um the earliest mm. okay um and that is where uh, it has the best we we tend to associate stages with prognosis um so it is the most treatable stage and has the best prognosis if um if treatment is applied uh, at that point um, then obviously there is disease progression mm. um, they, with each of the stages there's different levels of lymph node involvement um, and um, usually with stage 3 there's additional organ involvement meaning um, this, the cancer starts to grow into the adjacent structures like the anus um, um, and the urethra the bladder um, so uh, it, it, the, the the disease becomes more progressive and obviously stage four it has spread to other organs mm. um, uh, within the body that means like to your lungs to your liver um, bones etc and in that scenario it is not curable still potentially treatable but not curable unfortunately mm. so what role do you believe the community initiatives and public health uh, policies play in combating cervical cancer uh, loaded question there. <laughs> that is where the screen, basically public health initiatives is be talking about screening. Mm. Um, and I think they play the most fundamental role. If we, prevention, it's it's all summed up in one sentence. Prevention mm. is better than cure. So it forms the most fundamental role. But I mean, it requires buy-in from the public. So um, we can as doctors and medical health professionals and allied health professionals, etc., we can do so much, mm. but the patient, the public, the people who utilize the service, who are affected by the disease, they have to meet us halfway and actually ask for the um, for the treatment, um, because obviously you can't just force 
these things on everybody. It, mm. it, um, hel- we have choices in life. You know, speaking about doing so much, you know, are, are there currently any programs or policies in place that you think are particularly effective or need to be strengthened? Uh, not particularly. I mean, look, uh, we can always put more more money in the government sector, uh, more money into um, sexual health initiatives or sexual sex education initiatives um, at um, uh, at the, the school level. I know a lot of parents out there are screaming right now, don't teach my child about sex. We don't want to teach your child about sex. We want to teach them on how to manage the consequences of having sex. They are already having sex, whether we teach them about it or not. I think um, we're just, uh, I'm, I'm overthinking that they're not going to do it. They, I think th- there's just so much going on with with the laptops and access to information um, with AI and on, on all this uh, um, uh, computers and things like that, that they have access to the internet. To, to think that they do not have access is, I think, think keep you putting your head in the sand um so yeah i think that's where money can go if there is extra money but we live in south africa so there isn't extra money <laughs> <laughs> let's uh, be hopeful about extra money um there is two listeners who have different questions which i feel sounds the same so the one is saying uh walaikum salam why activate something unnecessary that's the other that's one. The other is saying, um, does 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 uh, the HPV immunity is not encourage sexual activity? Um, so I'm what I gather from this question because it doesn't seem too clear is that um, if you give me the vaccine, I'm going to then want to have sex. Uh, but then, I mean, Doctor, you explained it earlier. Our our Islam, our deen teaches us a lot of things that mm. are basically preventative measures in any case. So I'm not too sure about these two. I, I think um, uh, the the glass can be half full or the glass can be half empty. It's about perspective. Um, and I am not here to, um, I would say, to, to change your perspective. Um, ultimately, those are your children and this is your life um, so I, 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 I don't want to do that I my, my idea is to um, try and help you understand why we are putting it out there uh, why the vaccine is out there I don't think we we trying to encourage children to have sex absolutely not I think we're trying to prevent them from developing um, cervix cancer 20 years after they have already embarked on their first sexual encounter, be it willingly or unwillingly. Mm. Um, So, no, I I don't think the vaccine um, encourages sexual intercourse. I think it's important that a parent has the conversation with their child Mm. about why they are giving the child the vaccine. Um, The same way a parent should have the conversation with the child about what is safe and what is not safe why they should not be having sex under prior to getting married. I mean, the same reason, I mean, why are you going to tell a child don't have sex because you might have a baby mm. out of uh, 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 wedlock and then what are you going to do with that child? Mm. <laughs> I mean, that is a conversation between a parent and a child. Mm. Um, how you go about it, that is, I'm going to leave it in your capable hands. Each of us know our children best. I don't think that's the point of the vaccine. I think the point of the vaccine is really to protect um, and prevent a very dangerous disease later on. Mm. Um, as for the first uh, person, why activate something if it's... Why activate, uh, why activate something unnecessary? I think that could be in relation to the asymptomatic, maybe. Um, I, I I think my my focus on this is unnecessary. Um, just remember the perspective that I see. Um, I see the patient there with the fungating mass um, that's smelling from a mile away because she cannot um, because of this growth um, that she was too shy to get treatment for so 
you may see that as unnecessary. I see it as very necessary because an HPV vaccine could have prevented that mm. from happening. And uh, uh, an early appointment with a gynecologist every three years to get a pap smear could have prevented that from happening. Mm. So I think your perspective and my perspective may be a little bit different. Mm. Uh, perhaps you do not necessarily see that the consequences um, of the disease. Unfortunately, we do as medical professionals. And so we then see why screening the pap, uh, in terms of the pap smear or the um, uh, HPV vaccine are very, very necessary. Um, and, um, and yeah, and we definitely try to promote it. Mm-hmm. I, I've, I've been thinking throughout this conversation. Uh, so the one thing is to have the option to have sex if you want to, irrespective of the, the religion you follow, what your parents have taught you. The other thing is that we live in a country where it's one in three. And so if if you're going to count three people, three women or three girls, um, and one of them is going to be raped, then it's it's uh, it's a problem in itself. So we're already mm-hmm. dealing with um, an exposure, mm-hmm. um, a, a danger. So for me, it's like uh, if if we are saying, well, I, I'm for the vaccine and I, I see the need for it because if you are saying that you are meeting women who are, are too shy to even uh, get the help because firstly, the smell f- and what their uh, private area looks like and what they're experiencing and all that pain simply because we didn't understand and our our perspectives are different. Um, It's, uh, it's, I think if we can, if if you're gonna choose life, I'm I'm for choosing life. Uh, Yes, Uh, there's a listener who said, uh, Asalaamu Alaikum to the parents who is in doubt of the vaccine. I was a good Muslim young lady who saved myself for my husband after nikah, even at the age of 25 and um, years later to discover I have HPV, which wish I was offered it years ago. We the innocent suffers. So at least uh, there's a listener sharing with us her experience of as good as one might be, um, she too got it and it's not something that you wish upon yourself. Mm -hmm. And here she's saying had she known, had her parents or whatever the circumstances were allowed for the vaccine to happen, Mm -hmm. perhaps this would have been a different uh, discussion. Yeah, I think what many people don't realize is that your daughter may not be the one that's the problem. Mm. She may be listening to you and doing all the right things. And again, the guy may be also very good, but he may have had a little bit of a history before. Um, And look, again, I'm not one, um, I don't like to, to judge people on their history because it's the history that eventually pulls you to the person that you become, um, which may be a strong um, uh, and very devout person. My, I mean, always the, the story of Hazrat Umar um, uh, comes to li- comes to light. Mm. But um, again, people make mistakes. People do things when they don't understand it, where the the energy and drive of youth fuels wrong decisions. Um, But then you grow up and you learn better and you know better. Um, And then one must just remember that there are ways to protect our children. Um, Not necessarily, it doesn't always encourage um, wrong behavior, just maybe just protects them. As long as they understand that, I think that's the right message to get across. Another listener saying, uh, does the vaccine have an expiration date? Can it last a lifetime? Uh, no. Um, as far as I understand, um, one, you will need to get boosters. Um, uh, the s- same as um, the measles vaccine, you do need to get boosters. Um, and I mean, hepatitis uh, vaccines, H- hepatitis B, you do need to get boosters. I don't, uh, unfortunately, I'm, I'm, my knowledge of the time interval um, I don't know exactly I may I'll probably have to check that one up mm. Mm. Um, I just wanted to read because uh, there's 
Let me just read this just so that we reiterate why we have in this discussion. Um, it is the second most common cancer among women in our country with a staggering of 50.5% um, increase in deaths due to cervical cancer between this was between 2008 and 2018, according to Stats SA, right? And so um, there's been a lot of work around cancer and trying to help people live longer and so on. And, and I don't know because I've, there's, uh, there's a few listeners who are uncomfortable with uh, this cervical cancer topic. And I think they, there is a comfort I don't know around breast cancer maybe being more easy to understand and other cancers but this because it's um how you get it mm-hmm. uh, maybe is the discomfort but i think it's important to note that you can die um and if also, you uh, just because the doctor is here i, mean, I have to ask <laughs> this you know uh, sometimes you we've got polygamous marriages you know mm. and so you've got uh, you're sharing a husband mm. does it affect the next women yes simple answer absolutely because if one of those wives has it mm. she can pass it to the husband and then he passes it on to the other three wives if he's participating in intercourse with the other three as well that's if he has four wives um, obviously not all people have four wives um, of course if he has it or from the beginning maybe from a previous marriage or from um, selling his wild oats um, then he can obviously give it to any woman that he participates in sexual intercourse with so um, if somebody has I think what, what kind of maybe portraying a little bit of a terrible picture here yeah um, in a healthy immune system can fight HPV. Mm. Yeah. So not everybody who gets HPV will will uh, develop a chronic form of of the HPV. Mm. So hypothetically, not all of those women will end up developing HPV and then maintain getting it in the chronic form which will then result in them developing cervix cancer in the long term. Mm. So uh, just something, a little bit of hope at the end of the tunnel, because I feel like I'm giving lots of people really bad <laughs> news here. <laughs> you know, uh, it's the final few minutes with the doctor, you know, as as a sports person. When it's the final few <laughs> minutes, uh, you, you make sure that you you kick your shots on target. You know, you, you, you don't do your corners or your indirect free kicks and so on. Uh, just to conclude, uh, doctor, what sort of message would you like to send to women across South Africa, you know, including those who are skeptical? about this topic regarding the cervical cancer and how can they take charge of their health and ensure that they and that ensure that they are doing everything possible to prevent this disease doctor before you answer that please hold that thought uh, just a listener wanting to know about the doses um, in terms of the intervals uh, of the boosters I, that was the one thing I didn't know I'm off, um, to that listener I honestly cannot tell you the answer to that question um, I'll have to check up. I'll send it to Farid, the answer to Farida. Oh, actually, I'm, I'll be here next week, uh, Tuesday again, inshallah. inshallah. So um, inshallah. I will look, make sure to look it up and I will let you know. Okay, inshallah. Check mm-hmm. uh, to answer your question, Khalid, mm. I think, number one, there has been hundreds of generations since Adam alayhi salam mm. to where we are now. Question one, how did we get here? Mm. All of our parents had sex. Mm. and had us okay second of all we all have to die okay so there yeah. will be one way or the other something will happen to us to die, you know. for us to eventually pass yeah but there are many things that we can do to let ourselves live healthier and mm. better lives and Ultimately, again, our religion teaches us those who see. If you don't, you have to help yourself. Yeah. Yeah. If you don't seek help, you, you how can you ever, in, how can you ever receive it? So you have to actually put it out there. You have to acknowledge that there is a problem to actually receive the help that is available. And ultimately, doctor, you know, um, 
Can you please also encourage parents to do talk to their sons as well? Absolutely. It's boys and girls. It takes two to tango. Uh and tango meaning something else there. <laughs> Excuse <laughs> the pun. Um so uh, please talk to both your sons and your daughters. Um because ultimately our sons are the ones that are going to be responsible for looking after their wives and their daughters. Um and our daughters are going to be the mothers of the future inshallah which must also grow up and give learn um teach their children how to be strong um and how to be able to to look after themselves. Mm. I agree. I'm in full support of having honest and open conversations uh with children and I'm in full support of the concept of prevention is better than a cure. Dr. Fatima Hussain, it's been a pleasure chatting with you and told we see you next week too so inshallah. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaykum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.